I have one uh, comment left over from last time. Uh, a colleague in Brazil who was following along asynchronously uh, pointed out that apropos of uh, my opening remarks about the transition from thinking about the relation between appearance and reality in terms of the categories of resemblance to the modern invention of the categories of representation to think about it, that the second and third chapters of Michel Foucault's book, The Order of Things, uh, Les Mots et les Choses, les Choses, but in English, The Order of Things, is about this exact uh, topic. This was Cal Rodriguez uh, pointed this out. And that's something I knew, but uh, I just <clears throat> didn't think to mention. Uh, if you don't know Foucault at all, the first three chapters of that book, Orders, The Order of Things, is a fabulous uh, introduction uh, to him. And it's absolutely apropos of the way I was introducing uh, the significance of the concept of representation. So uh, also in the handout, you'll find um, uh, a plan, uh, an outline uh, for today. Uh, I see the whole book as uh, radiating out from chapter four. That's where the core uh, argument is. And that's the way I propose to discuss it. That is in the first half, I want to talk about Rorty's core argument that's uh, both a reading of recent philosophy uh, 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 of his time, uh, but mostly a philosophical argument. Uh, and then I see the rest of the book is coming in concentric circles uh, around that. And some of the uh, farthest out circles, the discussion of the difference between um, uh, edifying discourses and epistemological discourses in the conclusion, uh, I'm not going to get to talk to about it all. But in the next level out from the discussion, from the core argument, is uh, a series of considerations about the relationship between foundationalism in epistemology and representationalism in semantics. And then uh, at a third level out from that, uh, wrapped around it all, is a metaphilosophical uh, discussion uh, uh, about uh, the role that philosophy ought to aspire to play in uh, the larger culture. So I, I want to devote the first half uh, of our session to talking about that core argument and the second half to talking about those other two circles, uh, concentric circles moving out uh, from it. So I think the, uh, a good way to begin is to see uh, the historical run-up and context that uh, Rorty places his argument in. Uh, because he has uh, a picture of the history of philosophy since Kant as a Manichaean struggle, a struggle between the darkness and the light, uh, between two ways of doing philosophy that he thinks uh, are the key to understanding uh, 19th century philosophy and its progression, and which he thinks then is just recapitulated in the 20th century, and his diagnosis, what I'm calling his core argument in uh, philosophy in the mirror of nature, uh, is his account of how we are just recapitulating that 19th century struggle. And the two camps are uh, neo-Kantianism, uh, Kant's tradition uh, as it's transformed by the two schools of neo-Kantianism, the Marburg school and the Freiburg school. Uh, Marburg is Cohen and Natorp. Uh, Freiburg uh, 
Rickert and Pindelbond uh, that passed that tradition on uh, not only to sort of their official neo-Kantian heir, Kassirer, um, uh, but also to C.I. Lewis uh, and to Carnap. Now, if you look at the last page of the handout, you'll see uh, uh, a genealogy of this neo-Kantian, neo-Kantianism. And I'll say something more in a minute about sort of what the core of that uh, neo-Kantian tradition was as were he seeing it. But uh, crucial to it is the idea that there can be uh, a general theory of knowledge, uh, a general theory of how it is that subjects relate to the objective world, uh, that philosophy has at its core uh, that discipline of uh, epistemology. In a somewhat broader term, I'd say that picture is an attempt to understand understanding by seeking its common structure. And that's going to be a common structure whether the understanding you're looking at is in natural science or in social science or indeed in art. Um, and in uh, Rorty's telling, Hegel took that Kantian uh, picture of philosophy as the queen of the sciences and socialized it, put it in the context of the actual social practices of uh, interacting with things in the world and historicized it, uh, saw that what for the Kantians was uh, an ahistorical perennial structure of the relation between subjects and objects actually was different in different periods of the culture and uh, that different philosophical traditions responded to those uh, differences. And that Marx, after Hegel's socializing and historicizing of the study of knowledge, naturalized that picture. Uh, so that by the end of the 19th century, uh, Rorty thinks you could see the possibility of bringing philosophy back down to earth as the study of human social practices uh, at particular historical periods uh, where those practices were understood in a broadly naturalistic way as continuous with the interactions of non-discursive animals with their environments. Uh, and that socialized, historicized, naturalized philosophy is then going to take its place alongside the other disciplines as just having a different perspective on these practices, which can be studied equally by uh, natural scientists, biologists, but particularly by social scientists, sociologists, historians, uh, and so on. And the picture of philosophy is sitting above them as the queen of the sciences because of its uh, mastery of forms of knowledge, of knowledge in general, that pretension would be given up. Uh, Rorty thought at the end of the 19th century, that prospect for a genuinely post-Kantian uh, philosophy was a live one. And that's what his uh, heroes, the American pragmatists, did. That's the scene that was set for Charles Sanders Peirce to kick off uh, the pragmatist revolution. But, Rorty says, it was not to be. Russell and Husserl, each in his own way, invented something for philosophy to be apodictic about again. Uh, invented, each in his own way, uh, a new kind of armchair philosophy that would study knowledge a priori uh, and reinstitute the kind of uh, 
uh, distinctive authority and privilege of philo that philosophy, that, that Kantian and neo-Kantian philosophy had, uh, uh, had claimed. Husserl, much more directly motivated by Kant. Russell, uh, in no small part by Frege, whose relation to Kant is complicated. It's important to sort it out, but I'm not uh, going to say anything about it. Uh, but uh, each one of them invented a new way for uh, philosophy to be thought of as occupying the position that Kant had thought it deserved as the queen of the sciences, sitting in judgment over the attempts of other departments of at least the high culture to understand things, to know things in virtue of philosophy's a priori understanding of what that knowledge or understanding could consist in, of what its structure must be for it to be good knowledge or not so good knowledge or not knowledge at all. That was philosophy's job to uh, determine. And Rorty thinks that, and, and this is the first of his sort of astonishing claims about the 20th century philosophy that he looks at, that analytic philosophy is just the form that neo-Kantianism took uh, in the 20th century, uh, that it's just the pursuit of neo-Kantianism by other means. And his particular heroes, the ones that are the subject of this core chapter four, Wilfred Sellers and Willard Van Orman Quine, are pragmatist critics of analytic philosophy uh, and belong in a box with the original pragmatist critics of 19th century neo-Kantianism. So he sees the same dialectic as just played out a century later. Uh, in effect, he thinks the 20th century in philosophy was just one long pointless detour that brought us back to where we could have been uh, at the end of the 19th century if these uh, amazing, admirable philosophical geniuses, Russell and Husserl, had not figured out brilliant new ways to revive the um, uh, neo-Kantian picture. Now, <clears throat> I said this first interpretive idea of uh, Rorty's motivating and animating this picture of the history as one of repetition, where really all the 20th century brought in the way of progress was to bring the new technical tools of logic uh, to bear in uh, reviving uh, neo-Kantianism. Uh, there was technical progress, but in larger philosophical terms, just the same dialectic was played out. But two astonishing things that uh, uh, Rorty is claiming here is first that the tradition downstream from Husserl and the tradition downstream from Russell are not that different. They're just different forms of neo-Kantianism. Uh, where people think of the continental tradition uh, that Husserl uh, instituted as uh, entirely at odds with the analytic uh, tradition, where he's saying, really, uh, these are intramural differences within uh, neo-Kantianism. And that's certainly not anything that, that people on either side of that uh, divide uh, took to be the case. Second, just on the analytic side, Rorty's analytic colleagues would have been and were astonished to be told that they were Kantians. 
Uh, after all, uh, it was part of the fighting faith of analytic philosophy uh, as formulated by Russell and Moore in the early years of the century to see it as a complete rejection of the idealist tradition that culminated in Hegel and in their teacher and uh, the source of their early uh, philosophical enthusiasm, F.H. Bradley. Uh, analytic philosophy was to be uh, understood by its opposition to that uh, Hegelian idealist tradition. And uh, both Russell and Moore, having, as I say, been raised in this Bradleyan uh, neo-Hegelian, British Hegelian tradition, knew enough about the German idealists to see that you could not throw Hegel out. So you could not uh, open the door wide enough to let Kant into your philosophical canon and slam the door quickly enough to keep Hegel out. That Hegel was just too powerful and interesting a reader of Kant, and that if you wanted to throw Hegel out, in the end you had to throw Kant out as well, and say that the idealist rot had set in already with transcendental idealism, uh, and that absolute idealism was just uh, distilling a, a sort of rotten essence out of it. So the canon that Russell and Moore put in place moved from Leibniz through uh, John Stuart Mill to Frege, completely avoiding what they saw as uh, a detour, an oxbow uh, in the philosophical river that went from Kant uh, to Hegel to Bradley. But now Rorty is saying to his analytic colleagues, and remember, uh, this is the 1970s. Uh, the Kantian revival in Anglophone philosophy is in its infancy. Uh, Rawls is only publishing uh, The Theory of Justice in 1970. It's being absorbed in the 70s so that Kant's practical philosophy becomes uh, uh, taken seriously in the Anglophone world in a way that it had not. Uh, and Peter Strawson and Jonathan Bennett on the theoretical side uh, only wrote their books uh, in the very late 60s and never really had the effect of reviving interest in Kant theoretically in Anglophone philosophy mm, for a couple more academic generations. Uh, so Kant was only read uh, in Anglophone philosophy departments in a historical sort of way. Now I will say one exception is that the course in the first critique really in uh, the analytic of the first critique that C.I. Lewis had taught to everyone uh, who was trained at Harvard uh, in the middle years of the 20th century, that course survived. Uh, his students who spread out and taught uh, in all the great philosophy departments in the US continue to teach that Kant course. But it was still thought of as the history of philosophy rather than philosophy. And yet, uh, Rorty is claiming that the analytic, philo that analytic philosophy is just another phase of neo-Kantianism. He saw Kant's fingerprints all over contemporary philosophy. As he puts it, uh, philosophy of language is just doing, is just taking the place that uh, a theory of representation, a non-linguistic theory of representation played in Kant. And the idea that philosophy of language is first philosophy, as Michael Dummett put it, uh, that it and a suitably linguistic, linguistically inflected philosophy of mind 
could serve as a successor subject to Kantian epistemology as a general theory of, res of representation uh, is through and through Kantian. And he saw further that the specific emphasis on understanding the language semantically in general terms and the possibility of knowledge epistemologically proceeded in analytic philosophy in terms of the two principal species of representation that Kant had identified. Uh, sense experience on the one hand and logically elaborated meaning analytic reason relations, relations of implication and uh, incompatibility. Uh, that's exactly how they, uh, how analytic philosophy pursued that Kantian project of a general theory of representation and so uh, of knowledge. If you look at C.I. Lewis in uh, his 1929 book, uh, Mind and the World Order, uh, or his 1940s book, Analysis of Knowledge and Valuation, you see him constructing our knowledge by asking how these two elements get together, how sensory experiences, uh, experience in, in the sense of ethnicity, how that can be, uh, how, how those bricks uh, of content can be articulated logically into meanings, uh, into claims that can stand in justificatory relations to one another uh, and reveal the way the world is. He was the fan of givenness from which um, uh, Sellers took the name of his target. The myth of the given is uh, C.I. Lewis's uh, myth. But Carnap's first uh, work, uh, the Aufbau, the construction of the world, uh, again, starts with uh, sense experiences, of as, as events, and looks at, at, and looks at concepts as logical constructions out of them. Uh, from Rorty's point of view, uh, the only excuse for not seeing this as pure neo-Kantianism, now revivified by the addition of the powerful modern methods of logic, is historical ignorance about Kant and uh, neo-Kantianism. Uh, it seemed clear to him that this was just a pure contemporary form of that uh, neo-Kantianism. And this was, uh, this diagnosis was uh, confirmed for him uh, in uh, the way in which Sellers and Quine couched their criticisms. I should, uh, now I should point out, and this I think is the, on the uh, you might want to look at the penultimate page of that handout uh, that you can get uh, uh, from the website. Uh, it's a striking fact that both Sellers and Quine, uh, uh, Rorty's heroes in this section, both Sellers and Quine were uh, taught by C.I. Lewis. Uh, C.I. Lewis was uh, uh, their teacher at Harvard where Quine, of course, did his doctorate. Uh, Sellers never wrote his dissertation at Harvard, but was a graduate student. Uh, but was a, indeed, he didn't write his dissertation anywhere. He never got a degree. Uh, but uh, having failed to write a dissertation at Oxford, Sellers then failed to write a dissertation at Harvard. But he was a C.I. Lewis student there. And Quine, uh, whose other supervisor besides Lewis was officially uh, Whitehead, actually snuck off uh, to consort with Carnap, who was the great influence on him. And in Seller's case, uh, and you know, lifelong friend, there's a book of their correspondence, Dear Van, Dear Rudolph. Uh, and Sellers credits Carnap with having uh, wakened him from his dogmatic slumbers and converted him to what Sellers in his earliest writings called the new way of words, 
uh, particularly the first 20 years of Sellers' writing, is uh, uh, impressed through and through with Carnap, Carnapian language, Carnapian questions. So both these great critics uh, that uh, Rorty sees as the pragmatist, as the prophets of the new pragmatist way forward at the end of the 20th century, both of them are explicitly responding to uh, C.I. Lewis and uh, Carnap, who most explicitly have this um, uh, neo-Kantian project that they're pursuing. Now, C.I. Lewis, uh, who was the student on the one hand of William James, uh, Rorty's favorite pragmatist, and on the other hand of Josiah Royce, who was the most prominent American representative of the Bradleyan uh, neo-Hegelian um, uh, stream of philosophical thought. Uh, C.I. Lewis always thought of himself as synthesizing these two uh, strands, but he did it by going back to Kant. And he did explicitly think of himself as a neo-Kantian, as the neo-Kantian of his generation. Uh, now, though we're not going to read any of uh, Lewis, you know, indeed, we're not reading the Quine and the Sellers, uh, uh, one, one, or the Carnap, you know, we, in a different way of doing this, if we were, of course, focused just on this uh, master argument of Rorty's in uh, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, we would uh, uh, drive back into these, but so much being so little time. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> C.I. Lewis explicitly did think of himself as a neo-Kantian. Carnap, who was every bit as much of a, of a neo-Kantian as C.I. Lewis was, never did. He thought of himself as a logical empiricist. And both Sellers and Quine uh, pitch their arguments against empiricism in its 20th century uh, version, not against Kantianism. Uh, that was thought to be uh, the enemy, empiricism. We're empiricists, we're not Kantians. Uh, what Rorty is seeing, uh, what C.I. Lewis already saw, is that the new bringing to bear the new powerful methods of 20th century logic in the service of an empiricist project is a Kantian idea. Uh, that's to, to use logic to articulate the conceptual element of a Kantian uh, picture. I said, we're not gonna read Lewis, but off stage, he's a pivotal character in the story that we're telling. For Rorty, he's not really a pragmatist at all. He had uh, inherited from his teacher, from his pragmatist teacher, James, some pragmatist elements. Uh, you can see them in both of those books, Mind in the World Order and Analysis of Knowledge and Valuation. But at heart, he's a neo-Kantian. And so on the other side of this Manichaean divide of the neo-Kantians and the pragmatist critics uh, of them. Not really a pragmatist at all. We'll see that Cheryl Misak, uh, one of the most pointed of Rorty's critics, claims that's exactly wrong, that C.I. Lewis was the uh, paradigmatic pragmatist of his generation. We'll see she distinguishes uh, the living uh, wing of the pragmatist tradition as going from Peirce through C.I. Through Lewis to Sellers and Quine. Uh, and she thinks that the bad, philosophically uh, weak strand of pragmatist thought is the one that goes from James to Dewey to Rorty. Uh, so for her, Lewis is a paradigmatic pragmatist, 
for Brody, he's not really a pragmatist at all. So he's a pivotal figure in the battle over, pra over pragmatism that we'll see uh, being waged between Rorty and uh, Misak in uh, this first section, uh, in this first section uh, of the course. And Rorty takes it uh, as a confirmation of his uh, diagnosis of the underlying Kantianism sort of disguised as a form of empiricism that is at play in uh, analytic philosophy that Sellers and Quine never appreciated each other's critiques. Uh, Sellers continued to accept analyticity and in particular the distinction between necessary and contingent truths that uh, Rorty takes it to be Quine's glory to have demolished and Quine never gives up the idea of the sensuous given that uh, it was Sellers glory to demolish, particularly in his writings of the 50s and early 60s that see knowledge as uh, uh, that, that see the web of belief as a structure of what he calls posits, uh, things that are proposed to systematize our sensory experience, which comes to us unconceptualized. That is, is paradigmatically the kind of givenness that Sellers argues against. And uh, from Rorty's point of view, this is them retreating into other elements of the Kantian structure, uh, even though they have savagely criticized and he thinks successfully criticized key elements of that, that are common to their teachers, C.I. Lewis and Carnan. Uh, okay, so this uh, historical picture, uh, uh, not just the part that sets it in the larger frame that gets the running start by a reading of what happened in the 19th century, but this account of 20th century philosophy uh, of analytic philosophy is just the latest form of neo-Kantianism. This is already uh, a radically original reconceptualization of what was going on in philosophy. It was already going to make people angry or dismissive, particularly on uh, the analytic side. When Rorty has his Kara and becomes more interested in what's going on on the continental uh, side of things. Again, what he's interested in is the critics of Husserl. Uh, so Heidegger and Derrida, uh, rather than uh, uh, Husserl and, and the phenomenologists uh, themselves. So maybe I'll pause at that point to see if there are uh, responses or questions to that uh, historical stage setting? Hi, Bob. Yeah, Tom. Um, I just I have a question about something you said something uh, somewhat earlier on, um, saying how uh, Oh yeah, Rorty's critique was going to, uh, you know, bring um, bring philosophy back down to earth in a certain way, um, away from this sort of abstract theory of knowledge. But maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just reading too much into how you said it. But bringing it back down to earth suggests that it was down to earth at one point before. Who would be the who would be the sort of figures Rorty would have seen or you would have seen as having had it back down to earth. Because the way he frames this is, since Plato, there's been this urge to um, do epistemology in the way that he's criticizing. So what would be the alternative historically? Uh, Hegel, the American pragmatists, and particularly Dewey's naturalized Hegel, he thinks. Okay. So he thinks of Dewey as uh, having corrected, this is, Rorty now, I would not endorse this sure. uh, characterization of Hegel, 
he, he sees Hegel as having had a failure of anti-metaphysical nerve uh, that Dewey corrected uh, on his behalf. Uh, it's of the essence of McDowell's reading of Hegel that his anti-metaphysical nerve did not at all fail. But uh, um, yeah, that's the way he would be thinking about it. Okay, thanks. Okay, let me say something now about the core argument that uh, uh, the philosophical argument now as opposed to the historical sort of stage setting and framing of it. Again, uh, it involves two really radically innovative philosophical ideas and a new relation between them two. Uh, and, and this more than anything else is what, what I wanna make sure uh, we sort of all see the structure, uh, all see the structure of. Rorty sees something crucially in common between the two kinds of representation that Kant had distinguished, uh, his intuitions and concepts, which remember it was Kant's innovation in Kant's own telling of the story to see that what made, what, what was necessary to make uh, Descartes innovation, uh, what for Kant is the invention of the concept of representation work, uh, Kant saw that we needed to distinguish these two different kinds of representation and see them as making fundamentally different kinds of contribution to our knowledge, playing fundamentally different kinds of functional roles in uh, our experience and cognition. And that the mistake of, the, the common mistake of the empiricists and the rationalists was to try and make do with one kind of representation and see uh, the sensuous and the conceptual as ends of a continuum. Uh, for the empiricists, the sort of clear end of the continuum is the sensuous and uh, they need some notion of abstraction of leaving things out to get uh, simulacra of the conceptual and the uh, rationalists doing it the other way around, starting with the reason relations that articulate concepts and trying to understand the sensual as confused uh, versions of those. Kant's innovation is to say, no, these are completely different. They play different roles. You've got to have, uh, you've got to have both of them. The first piece of Rorty's core argument here, the first insight is, he says, there's something they have in common uh, these two. They play a common epistemological role. Oh. And this is not something, this is not an idea that Kant had had. Now I want to say what that common role is in just a minute, but let me say with, uh, let me leave down a marker for the second innovative idea. The second innovative idea was he saw uh, Seller's critique of the first kind of representation of uh, the role of ex that experience was taken to play in epistemology and Quine's critique of the role that concepts and their analytic meaning relations that they underwrite are taken to play he saw those as having a common core. Sellers and Quine didn't. Uh, nobody else saw those two critiques as two applications of one line of thought, a broadly pragmatist line of thought. In retrospect, this is uh, something like obvious. And we see Misak in uh, you know, a full generation younger than Rorty sort of takes it as so obvious as to be essential to her account of how analytic philosophy far, sorry, sorry pragmatism, uh, sorry, analytic philosophy as far from being the latest form of neo-Kantianism is just the, the latest form of pragmatism. 
uh, and Sellers and Klein are uh, poster children for this view. But uh, Rorty has these two ideas, these two assimilations that he sees. He has a, an, a new idea about how uh, sense impressions and meanings belong in a box together, and a new idea about how the criticisms of them, from what we can agree is a pragmatist point of view, uh, are applications of a pragmatist methodology together. Neither of those were ideas that anybody else had. Uh, and Rorty brings them together. Uh, it's because of the common role that he sees uh, sense impressions and uh, meaning analytic claims playing in common that he can see uh, the common pragmatist core to the criticisms of by Sellers and Quine. So uh, not only does he have an innovative uh, historical genealogy of the contemporary uh, philosophical situation, placing it in the framework of a reading of the 19th century, as well as a reading of the 20th century. But he has these two separate ideas, each of which is uh, an original uh, philosophical uh, thought. And he deploys these together. So here's the glue that holds them together and let him, let him see both of those other things. And it's an epistemological view. Uh, now, this story that I'm going to tell is best told, I think, and Rorty agreed, uh, by his Princeton PhD student, Michael Williams, uh, uh, made his career at Northwestern and at Johns Hopkins. In his first book, which was the book out of his dissertation, uh, called Groundless Belief. Uh, and it's uh, a distillation of this core uh, connection between the idea that assimilates uh, uh, sensuous givenness and analyticity on the one hand, and that lets us see the common pragmatist core of the Solarsian critique of the first and the Aquinian critique of the second. Uh, and that is uh, in terms of what later on Williams would call the Agrippan trilemma in uh, epistemology. The Agrippan trilemma says either every claim, every justified claim we have, every candidate for truth, inherits its normative status as one we're entitled to or that's justified from some other claim or it doesn't. If it doesn't, this is the foundationalist alternative, then there are some unjustified justifiers uh, which have this positive justificatory status their subject is entitled to them, not by inheriting that entitlement from anywhere else, but just because of something about that kind of commitment. That's the foundationalist alternative. Or if we say, no, all justification is ultimately inferential justification, a matter of uh, entitlement flowing from premises to conclusions, then we get the other two elements of the trilemma, then either we have an infinite regress where P inherits its entitlement from Q because there's a good argument from Q to P, but now we have the same question, where did Q get its entitlement from? R, and that goes on forever. And we never get to anything that we're simply entitled to without having to ask the question about the warrants for the entitlement that was 
inferentially inherited. That's an infinite regress, a kind of skepticism. Uh, is there really entitlement in that case? Or when you ask about this uh, uh, regress, ask after the entitlement of the premises from which you uh, inferentially inherited the entitlement of the conclusion, you go around in a circle. You come back to some claim that already appeared higher in this story. Uh, well, coherentists about justification uh, try and make this work. Again, there's a threat of skepticism. Maybe the whole thing, this, this whole system just swings free of what it's supposed to be representing or about. Oh. So it looks as though you've got to choose between some variety of skepticism or at least some view that leaves you open to structural skeptical, skeptical challenges. Uh, or you have to be a foundationalist and say that there are unjustified justifiers. Now, I can't resist saying that the um, when we look back on this uh, Agrippan trilemma, uh, which the Stoics, Agrippa, had uh, raised, but which was uh, really only a big deal in 20th century epistemology. Uh, when, when we look back on it uh, today, what stands out after the lessons that Rorty extracted from us, uh, for us, uh, from Klein and Sellers, we're struck by the assumption that the meaning of these claims is an input to this structure. They all mean what they mean, independently of which of these three alternatives about justification we take. Uh, and it's precisely that uh, independence and antecedent intelligibility of the contents of these claims before we've asked about the reason relations they stand into one another epistemologically. It's precisely that assumption that uh, we need to reject in order to get beyond the Agrippan trilemma. Uh, but that's a lesson for the, you know, for later on uh, in our story. Uh, specifically, I, I think this comes home when you think about the coherentist approach to justification, which if you look at an old fashioned, by which I mean 25 year old epistemology book, you'll see, oh, Larry Bonjour say, is a coherentist about justification. That's one of the main schools of foundationalism and have coherentism always was about meaning, not about justification. Uh, and uh, it, it never worked very well, thought of as a view about justification that didn't come with a theory of meaning with it. That's just a, a side remark. Here's what Rorty saw. If because of the threat of skepticism, you're going to be a foundationalist in epistemology and say there are you're going to be a foundationalist in epistemology. There's actually two kinds of regresses that you're worried about. Two kinds of unjustified justifiers that you need. The one Agrippa talks about and, and that looms large in the Agrippan trilemma is the regress on premises. Uh, okay, you can claim P is justified. Give me a reason for that. Okay, I'll give you Q. That's a premise from which you can derive it. Well, but what about the reasons for Q? Derive that from R. You need regress stoppers on the side of premises. And pretty much everybody's candidate for those is the sensuous given. Experiences, mm. perceptual experiences, perceptual judgments, something that 
creatures that are wired up and trained the way we are just find ourselves with. Uh, commitments that we undertake non-inferentially, not as the result of a process of inference, but just by exercising our reliable differential responsive dispositions. So Rorty says a crucial feature of Kantian intuitions of that kind of representation, the sense impressions, is that they can play the functional role in uh, foundationalist epistemology of being regress stoppers on the side of premises. But, he says, there's another kind of regress because we can ask about the justification, not only of the premises of the justifying inference, but also of the inferential move, of the connection between premises and conclusions. You say P and I say Y and you say Q. And I say, well, why should I think that Q implies P? What's your justification for that inference for that relation of implication. Why should I think that that's entitlement preserving? And here, Rorty says, this is where you invoke analytic claims. You say, oh, that's true in virtue of the meanings of the terms involved. There's an, a meaning analytic connection between the premises and the conclusions. So if you actually grasp the meanings of these things, I can show you how to derive using meaning alone and logic, logical constructions out of these meanings, I can show how to derive the conclusion from uh, the premises. And this, each in his own way, is what C.I. Lewis did and what Conab did in the alphabet to underwrite those, the reason relations that uh, are invoked as justificatory in our epistemology, to underwrite those by appealing to meaning analytic claims and maybe some logical glue to put those uh, together. So Rorty says, to, to bring off your uh, foundationalist epistemology, you need two kinds of regress stoppers. You need regress, something playing the functional role in your foundationalist epistemology of a regress stopper on the side of premises and something to play the functional role in your foundationalist epistemology of a regress stopper on the side of the reason relations, the implications and uh, incompatibilities. And for that, you need what he now coins the phrase privileged representations of exactly the two kinds of representation you know, uh, that Kant distinguished. Uh, you need uh, sense impressions, the sensuous given, in order to uh, be a regress stopper on the side of premises, and you need meanings, immediately grasped meanings, authoritative analytic connections uh, as regress stoppers on the side of uh, implications. So he says there's intimate connection between foundationalist epistemology and Kantian representationalism in semantics. Uh, the two kinds of uh, representation that Kant, that it was one of Kant's principal innovations to distinguish, not only, but, but Kant is thinking about them in terms of the different, the different functional roles that they play in cognition but Rorty is stepping back and saying, 
Yes, but you need privileged species of these kinds of representations in your fundamentalist epistemology. They're both alike, these in being privileged representations, they have to have the kind of privilege, the kind of authority, the kind of entitlement that fits them to be regress stoppers, either in the regress of premises or in the regress of uh, implications of reason relations. And now he's going to say, uh, this is where the pragmatist, pragmatist line of thought gets a grip. Uh, Rorty's thought is the fundamental pragmatist idea is that all matters of privilege, uh, of entitlement, of justification are ultimately matters of social practice. That's the pragmatism uh, Rorty wants to get to. And uh, what Quine and Sellers have in common is a double-barreled holism about uh, uh, these privileged representations that says that sort of privilege, you know, when we unpack the kind of normative status that is, we see that's incompatible with thinking of them as immediately authoritative, in, that is authoritative apart from their relation to other representations in the way they have to be to perform this regress stopping role. And it's that holist um, uh, criticism of them that uh, is a crucial phase in both Sellers' critique of the sensory given and uh, Quine's critique of uh, the semantic given. Now, I want to say some more about how that critique goes in a minute, but uh, let me let me stop here for comments or questions, because uh, I really want us to be clear about this fabulous sort of reconceptualization of things that Rorty has uh, uh, undertaken. This idea that if you look at what foundationalist epistemology requires, you can see the different epistemological roles that these two different kinds of representations have to play, or at least some privileged species of them needs uh, to play. And this is not an idea that anybody before Rorty uh, had had, bringing together uh, the Kantian representationalist, representationalism, the, the uh, dualistic uh, picture of representation that uh, is at the heart of Kant's picture with the demands of uh, foundationalist epistemology. So that uh, Rorty could say, look, the big issue between uh, Lewis and Carnap on the one hand, uh, the sort of 20th century avatars of the bad guys in his Manichaean picture of philosophy, what's an issue between them and the 20th century avatars of the good guys, uh, the naturalizing uh, pragmatists, namely Sellers and Quine, is the presuppositions of these privileged representations. We're gonna bear, we're gonna see them bearing down on the demands on that notion of privilege or entitlement, that kind of entitlement that they've got, the kind of authority that they've got uh, that's what's going to give uh, Sellers and Quine uh, a grip, a, a critical grip, uh, a, a point of attack on those uh, on those views. So, um, do, do you see how that goes? Do you admire it? I want you to admire this thought. Uh, sort of where, wherever it goes thinking this kind of thought is doing good philosophy. Uh, it's, 
illuminating. I have a question. Um, yep. right. So I guess maybe we'll go into this more later, but I'm wondering how the, when, when you say, you know, where for Rorty, this is where the pragmatist line of thought gets in. I mean, it being rooted in social practice, like what, what is the nature of that? Like how compatible is that with what he's trying to say? If you're kind of taking on this view that that's, sensory or something. I, I don't know. Does that make sense? It's like, I would just help. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that's exactly sort of the next question. So, so suppose he's right that uh, we should see, um, well, we should see what's common to C.I. Lewis and to Carnin as them invoking two Kantian flavors of privileged representation. Uh, the sensuous given to perform the epistemal, the role, the functional role in a foundationalist epistemological theory of regress stoppers on the side of premises and uh, logically elaborated meaning analytic connections between claims uh, as privileged representations playing the functional role in foundationalist epistemological theories of regress stoppers on the side of inferences uh, when we see that uh, and we can see sellers attacking the sensory given the myth of the given he says and klein attacking uh, the semantically given the givenness of meanings he describes that in terms of a myth as well. For him, it's the myth of a museum, of the meanings of our uh, concepts and our claims as sort of arrayed behind glass in a cabinet where we can just see them and see whether the one includes the other or whether these two are different or uh, the same. And I said, uh, I think the argument uh, here or Rorty's understanding of what's common to these arguments, uh, I see is going in, th in three steps. Uh, so the first two have to do with thinking about the nature of this privilege that these representations have in order to function what they must have, what features must this uh, privilege have in order to be able to, for, for representations that have this kind of privilege, to be able to serve their role as regress stoppers. And, you know, we can think about the sensory given to begin with. Uh, they have to be immediately authoritative. Uh, they have to have an immediate authority that is then heritable inferentially by other things. They're the unjustified justifiers. Uh, they've got to have this uh, epistemic authority. And to be regress stoppers, they have to have that independently of any other epistemic commitments that their subject has. Why? Well, because if the authority of this uh, sense experience depends on some other commitment, it can't play the role of a regress stopper. Uh, because we can always ask, well, what about the credentials of this other claim that the credentials of this supposed regress stopper depends on? Uh, whatever authority the regress stopper on the side of premises has, it has to have independently of the authority of any other commitments that you make. So it's got to be intelligible atomistically as something that some, something could have independently of its relations to uh, other commitments that you've undertaken. 
And similarly, on the side of regress stoppers, of regress stoppers on the side of inferences, again, uh, when we ask, well, what's the justification of the move from Q to P? And you say, well, you can see that that's good because of your immediate grasp of the meaning connection between them, your immediate grasp of the meaning. Well, the authority of that meaning connection can't depend on other commitments that you've got. Uh, otherwise, it's not stopping the regress. It's still leaving open uh, uh, another step where we ask, well, what's the justification for those things on which it depends? Now, I described this, I used the phrase a little bit earlier, that there was a double-barreled holism uh, uh, being invoked by the critics. Uh, and that's corresponding to these two dimensions of immediacy uh, that play, having the kind of privilege that's required to play the functional role of a regress stopper requires. And one is, it's got to have the content that it has independently of the contents of other things. That's a kind of semantic holism. But most importantly, and this is the second sort of holistic parable, its content and the authority that it's got uh, has got to be independent of any other epistemic commitments, any other beliefs that you've got. Uh, if it isn't independent, if the semantic content that it's got, that you're grasping, the, the sensory experience or the uh, meaning, if grasp of that or it's being what it is depends on the authority of some other epistemic commitment you've got, then it's not properly a regress stopper because there's room to ask after that authority and it's not stop the regress. So there's a kind of holism that says you can't assume uh, Sorry, you, the atomism that's required of the authority says the semantics of this has got to be independent of the epistemology. Uh, Quine puts this as saying, well, the, the language has to be independent of your theory, meaning has to be independent of collateral beliefs. Uh, if it isn't, it can't serve this regress stopping purpose. And similarly, for bits of the sensuous given, uh, they need to be independent of what other bits of the sensuous given uh, you've got access uh, to if they're to perform this uh, regress stopping role. But most important, they've got to be independent of your other beliefs or, or what else you know to be the case, because insofar as they're dependent on that, uh, they don't stop the regress. We can always ask about the credentials of that uh, collateral commitment that they're dependent on. Now, that's the argument that uh, we see most clearly in the uh, form of a holism that says you can't separate the semantics from the epistemology. You can't say, look, uh, we can get straight about all these meanings and our knowledge of them before we ask about what our commitments about how things are in the world. Uh, the way Quine argues this is he says, the meaning has to at least determine the inferential role, what follows from a claim, what's evidence for it and against it. Uh, why? Well, if we're going to use these analytic meaning analytic claims as regress stoppers on the side of inferences, they've got to settle the goodness of inferences. But Quine says, and he calls this, now we're in, we're talking about two dogmas of empiricism, where um, uh, he calls this the Duhem point, what follows from a given claim depends on what collateral commitments you're allowed to bring in functioning as auxiliary hypotheses, as 
further premises in extracting the consequences. Some things will follow from it against the background of one set of collateral hypotheses and, another, and something else will follow from it, not that, uh, if you have another set of collateral hypotheses. So inferential role is not independent of your collateral commitments. So meaning isn't. So you can't fix your language in advance of asking which of these sentences you hold true. That is what your theory is, because the, your theory is the source of the collateral commitments that will determine the inferential role. And on the, uh, on, uh, the Salarzian side, he's saying for a sensory experience to have, to be able to play an evidential role, for it to serve as a premise from which you can uh, infer or as evidence for or justification of uh, some other claim, it has to be conceptually articulated. Conceptual articulation just is a matter of role in reason relations. Uh, but you can't just have this concept because concepts are roles in reason relations. You have to have a whole battery of concepts in order to have one. So, and, and to get those, that whole battery of concepts, you have to have actually been using them in making judgments and saying, oh, this thing is red and this one is not red. You have to have already committed yourself to a whole lot of risky claims involving these empirical concepts in order to count as grasping any of them. So again, the point is you can't think of the content of these privileged representations as immediate in a sense that rules out their dependence on your collateral epistemic commitments. Now here you might think of the later Wittgenstein saying, uh, strange as it may seem, agreement in meanings requires agreement in judgments. Now this is exactly the same, exactly the same point. Oh. So that's what I mean by a double barreled holism that Quine and Sellers are arguing for. It's a, it's a holism at the level of semantics. Uh, it's saying the meaning of one of these privileged representations is not independent of the meanings of the others. Uh, and at a meta level, it's saying, and neither is the semantics independent of your epistemic commitments. Uh, you, you've got to think of the whole that involves uh, actually committing yourselves to some self to some claims as a necessary condition of meaning read by read, or if then by if then. And Rorty thinks, sees, I would say, that in order to argue for that claim about the inseparability of semantics and epistemology, uh, both Quine and Sellers ask, well, what do you have to do in order to count as grasping this content what do you have to be able to do? Let's look at the practices of uh, applying these concepts or of uh, having these experiences. Uh, that is, you look to the, to the theory of the use of these expressions, to the pragmatics, in order to argue that the semantics and the epistemology can't be separated this way. Oh. Uh, now, this question uh, of whether you can separate the semantics from the epistemology, other people than Rorty came to see this. So when Jerry Fodor looked at what he objected to most about uh, the most prominent philosophers of his generation, uh, Quine, 
Davidson Dummett, he wasn't thinking about Sellers and Rorty. He says, they run together semantics and epistemology. They think that um, the process of committing yourself to some claims is relevant to the question, to some representations, is relevant to the question of what the content of the representation is. He says, that's the great bad, capital letters, the great bad of contemporary philosophy is running together semantics and epistemology, running together uh, a theory of meaning with a theory of understanding, which he's thinking of as of what grasp of meaning is. And now uh, he's thinking specifically of Davidson, who will certainly claim that, that uh, we can only understand meaning in terms of the process of, interp of interpreting, of attributing that meaning. But Dummett also says the notions of understanding and of meaning are two sides of one coin. Meaning is what you can understand. And we should look at what would count as understanding something in order to understand the meaning. Rorty saw this uh, 20 years before uh, Fodor came uh, to this diagnosis. Uh, and Fodor saw it as his personal task in philosophy to drive a wedge between these and to argue for the possibility of independently pursuing semantics. So I, I've now described the uh, two pieces of uh, Rohe's argument and the relation between them. So remember, this is diagnosing a common functional role that representations of the two Kantian kinds share. Uh, they both play the functional role in, epistemolo in foundationalist epistemological theories of regress stoppers. Um, and that's an assimilation that people had not made before. And he sees uh, also something common to Sellers' criticism of uh, sensuous givenness and Quine's critique of semantic givenness. Uh, both of them, without putting it this way, have looked carefully at the kind of privilege, uh, the kind, the constraints on the authority and the immediacy of the authority, right? So we could say that the privilege of those privileged representations is they have to be authoritative and they have to have that authority immediately, uh, not by relation to or inheritance from something else. Uh, and he sees both Quine and Sellers as interrogating that notion of privilege, that notion of the immediacy of their epistemic authority and saying, uh, well, it involves not just, it must not be epistemically derivative from anything else. And it can't be semantically dependent on any other epistemic commitments. And it's that last claim that Quine and Sellers reject. They, they say there, there isn't any uh, epistemic authority that's immediate in that sense. Uh, so he's assimilated those, those two arguments. And what's playing the, the middle ground here then is thinking in terms of foundationalist epistemologies. Um, so, so that's the story that, um, th that's the way I would describe the move that he's making in chapter four which everything else in the book is sort of wrapped around, uh, is either leading up to contexting or particularly after chapter four, deriving consequences from. So that's the most important thing to get on top of is that core argument. So comments or questions about that story? I've told the story 
significantly differently than, than Rorty himself does, but uh, hopefully that's a benefit of uh, hindsight. Hi, uh, Bob, I have a, I have a question, if, if that's all right. Yes, I um, I'm, I'm noticing there's, maybe this is uh, some kind of isomorphism between the, the representing relation and the justifying relation. So, you know, in the first lecture you talked about, okay, look, A represents B, and actually there's this second order problem, which is how can we represent the representing relationship to ourselves? And the way you're describing Rudy's story here, it's exactly the same thing, except instead of, you know, P representing Q, it's P justifying Q or, or inferring Q from P, and then also justifying or inferring the validity of the inference relation. Is, am, I, am I crazy there? Is that, is that obvious or is that weird or I don't know? No, it's it, it's not obvious. It's true, and uh, it's not uh, transparent. But the relationship between those is that is, uh, you know, if we step back just a little from this argument and say, well, what does Rorty want from this argument? Uh, I think it's a dynamite argument against foundationalism in epistemology. Uh, you know, he sees that uh, the critiques of Sellers and Klein together demolish sort of both halves of the neo-Kantian uh, strategy for uh, giving knowledge uh, a foundation. But uh, how many foundationalists are there anymore in epistemology? Uh, that battle actually was won, uh, uh, I think. There still are foundationalists in semantics, uh, and I would say the most notorious, well, the, the, I shouldn't say notorious, the most prominent contemporary foundationalists in semantics are uh, people like Frank Jackson and David Chalmers using the apparatus of two-dimensional modal logic uh, in the service of uh, a foundationalist semantics. But that's another, uh, that's another story. Uh, Rohe's target is officially not foundationalism in uh, epistemology, but representationalism in semantics. Uh, and he wants to use this attack on foundationalism in epistemology as a way to attack uh, representationalism in semantics. But at least as I've told the story so far, it's not so clear what the relationship between those is. Um, I mean, he sees... Uh, Yeah, how would I put this? Um, he sees Kant as having brought these things together. Uh, Kant as having told the story so that uh, representationalism in semantics and foundationalism in epistemology are two sides of one coin. Uh, now, so, uh, from Rorty's point of view, that's all part of the great bad Kantian tradition that you know the pragmatists are supposed to uh, get us past. Uh, and it's certainly true that Kant, uh, you know, these are all Kantian raw materials, uh, but Kant himself was not interested in. Uh, it's true to say he wasn't interested in epistemology, uh, not in classic Cartesian epistemology, which was uh, a response to the threat of epistemological skepticism. Uh, because Kant saw that uh, the way that epistemological question was framed had semantic presuppositions uh, about 
the representational purport of uh, our thoughts, uh, and that the real threat was semantic skepticism, uh, skepticism addressed to the intelligibility of the very idea of representation. Uh, and he thought that if we could get clear about what his term is the objectivity of our thought, that is, it's being directed at an object, uh, its representational purport, he thought if we could get clear about that, that we would solve epistemological skepticism uh, along the way. It would be a trivial consequence of getting clear about representational purport, uh, that we wouldn't have to worry about the possibility of our being radically uh, and globally out of touch, our representings out of touch with what's represented. I mean, the, the place in the first critique where he draws this consequence, the refutation of idealism, it's only a few pages long. Uh, at that point, he says, you know, this is a, a, a trivial uh, consequence that uh, uh, we can draw here. As a result, it doesn't seem right to think of him as a foundationalist epistemologist, as somebody who was concerned to reply to the Agrippan trilemma. Uh, it's something that uh, some neo-Kantians, in particular Carnap and Lewis, were concerned about. It was a big concern in 20th century epistemology. And at least in that regard, Rorty seems right. Uh, well, if we'd just taken the pragmatist line seriously that we had at the end of the 19th century, we wouldn't have worried about this ultimately silly question. Uh, and so we fought our way back to there. Uh, but uh, is it true that Kant welded uh, foundationalism and representationalism together so thoroughly that uh, we can't prize them apart now. As I say, to a first approximation, there aren't any foundationalist epistemologists anymore. Well, there basically aren't any epistemologists that worry about this uh, dialectical setting anymore. Uh, in the same way that and I'd say it's, it's of a piece with, uh, there not really being any empiricists anymore. Uh, of the two great uh, programs of analytic philosophy, empiricism and naturalism, uh, with uh, concern that, uh, Enlightenment empiricists had not gotten, you know, they were all naturalists, uh, but they hadn't really gotten those together. Uh, empiricist uh, strictures on modality collided with thinking of um, science as the measure of all things with that kind of naturalism. Uh, in Carnap's Vienna Circle, uh, there was an empiricist wing led by Schlick and a naturalist wing led by Neurath. And they differed over what you do when those collide, for instance, on the issue of the reality of laws of nature, the intelligibility of the idea of laws of nature. And the empiricist said, well, you should give up the naturalism. Science is wrong about this. And the naturalist said, you should give up the empiricism. Your empiricists are clearly wrong in being suspicious of the modality. And Carnap is trying to get these two together. And my sociological sense of the current situation in philosophy is the empiricist gave up the ghost. Empiricism was this foundationalist project that was epitomized in the Aufbau and in uh, C.I. Lewis, and people gave up on that. Uh, naturalism is what's left, and there's some empiricist remnants. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the uh, two-dimensional consciousness theorists. Uh, 
how Fodor himself wanted to revive classical empiricism. But by and large, that's a dead issue. Rorty is happy enough for us to use the concept of representation in our causal stories about subpersonal cognitive mechanisms. He has no problem with cognitive scientists postulating uh, internal representations as part of our causal story. I mean, if you read chapter three, and if you're thinking back on the uh, introduction to, to PMN, uh, he says he accepts the diagnosis that Locke ran together the causal question of how we, of what are the mechanisms by which we acquire knowledge uh, with the justificatory question of what entitles us to the claims that we make, uh, which Kant uh, strictly separated the uh, quid factus and the quid juris and saw uh, Locke, the celebrated Mr. Locke as giving us a mere physiology of the understanding uh, and focused us on the justificatory question, uh, those causal, even causal functionalists uh, thinking about inner representations at the subpersonal level, Rorty officially has no beef with them. Some of his admirers, Bert Dreyfus, do. But Rorty, officially, you don't step over his line until you start talking about concepts, about justification, about entitlement, authority, about our responsibility to the facts, say. All of those are personal level issues of justification of discursive normativity. And he's going to say it's here that the notion of representation leads us astray. Uh, I mean, his view is that the um, baggage that uh, the notion of representation has gotten by its uh, bad use at the level of justification at the personal level is so serious that it's going to be essentially impossible for us to shed that baggage and use hygienic versions of the notion of representation at, in our causal stories as well. But that's, he admits, guilt by association, suspicion, uh, you know, maybe there's, in principle, there's room for a perfectly fine use there. So, uh, so I think that there's a, uh, a question about uh, exactly how this original, insightful, and sort of altogether admirable recasting of uh, what's going on in the middle of the 20th century in analytic philosophy that Rorty has given us this core argument. I think there's a real question about just how it bears on semantic representationalism. Uh, how, how does it cut against that? And I think at this point, it, it's helpful to step back and we've mentioned this a little bit. Uh, uh, there's a larger historical framing that Rorty uh, gives to his argument uh, that comes out most clearly in the introduction to the book. Uh, now, like most introductions, it was the last thing he wrote. Uh, it is a sort of framing of the argument, which as he says in the introduction, chapter four is the core uh, of it. That's where the real work uh, gets done. And it annoyed him no end that people paid attention to the incendiary remarks about the death of philosophy at the end of the book, rather than you know, worrying about this core argument that was what he was making ever shakier inferences from as he goes out. But if you look at the passages I excerpted in the, uh, in the handout, um, he says in this first one, philosophy is a discipline 
sees it itself as an attempt to underwrite or debunk claims to knowledge made by science, morality, art, or religion, uh, really any of the other uh, corners of the high culture. Uh, I'm using that term to refer to uh, the activity of trying to understand what's going on in the culture, but sociologists and historians, uh, political theorists as well. It purports to do this on the basis of its special understanding of the nature of knowledge of mind. Philosophy can be foundational in respect to the rest of culture because culture is the assemblage of claims to knowledge and philosophy adjudicates such claims. Now, I would want to throw the word understanding in here as well as knowledge. Uh, I, often it makes a difference whether you're thinking about that, but in this philosophy is the queen of the sciences, Kantian picture. Yeah, we're the ones who understand what understanding is too. So they're all applying concepts and that's what we have a distinctive kind of authority over according to this conception. It can do so because it understands the foundations of knowledge and it finds these foundations in a study of the activity of representation, which makes knowledge or understanding possible. Uh, philosophy's central concern is to be a general theory of representation. Well, he objects to that because, he's saying, he objects to that uh, being used to justify uh, an orweaning, implausible and objectionable kind of disciplinary authority on the part of philosophy with respect to the rest of uh, the high culture. And uh, his complaint about Russell's innovations and Husserl's innovations in the early years of the 20th century as having been retrograde, as setting us back in our larger philosophical understanding. Uh, what's behind that for him is they gave us a new story we could tell, justify this Kantian story. And what he wants is, uh, a little bit down in the passages, to assert the possibility of a post-Kantian culture, one in which there is no all-encompassing discipline which legitimizes or grounds the others, or deserves to sit in judgment on the epistemic credentials uh, of their claims or of their procedures. Uh, that, that's what he most fundamentally uh, objects to. And it's uh, for that reason that he sees Russell and Husserl as uh, retrograde. And in fact, uh, Kant is just the most recent bad guy. Uh, for Rorty, Plato is really the bad guy here. This is a Nietzschean uh, reading. Uh, he said, this is the great conceit of philosophy that Plato uh, gives us. And that's something we should have gotten over already in the modern period when the Platonic versions became no longer uh, defensible. But uh, Descartes in his way and Kant distilling the Cartesian uh, revolution uh, to its real essence, uh, gave us a distinctively modern form, a distinctively modern because distinctively representational form uh, of this. Philosophy as the study of representation and as having a priori access to the notion of representation. We're not the empirical study uh, of it, uh, here, um, that least Kantian of works, the Tractatus, uh, is absolutely in uh, service of this modern Kantian version 
of uh, the queen of the sciences picture here because it's an a priori theory of representation uh, of the nature of all uh, representation. Uh, it's why philosophy is not one of the natural sciences. I forget which decimal number that is in uh, the Tractatus, uh, but that's the only sentence that appears verbatim in both the Tractatus and the Investigations. Philosophy is not one of the natural sciences. Uh, that identity of commitment uh, uh, obscures the, ver the, the revolution in Wittgenstein's own thought in his reasons for thinking that. Uh, he had a queen of the sciences sort of thought in the Tractatus. Uh, those people are in, you know, those natural scientists are engaged in describing and picturing things. And we're the ones who understand what doing that is. Uh, in uh, uh, the investigations, is a completely different justification, uh, you know, account of what we're doing and uh, justification uh, of it. But uh, on this account, uh, well, there's good reason if you reject this uh, great philosophical conceit, the Plato Kant uh, conceit for philosophy. Uh, if you reject that, there's good reason to reject foundationalism. And it's true that the distinctively Kantian form uh, of that depended on representationalism, but it's, it seems like you would need an argument that representation inevitably, it, in semantics, representationalism in semantics, taking representation to be the central concept in semantics, inevitably leads to foundationalism and to Platonic and Kantian overreaching, disciplinary overreaching for philosophy. And so far, we haven't seen that argument. Now, Rorty later on gives an argument like that that doesn't go through foundationalism. Uh, I think he gives two arguments like that later on. Uh, one with his sort of middle period, pure pragmatism, and then, which I think is, I think both of them are really interesting. Uh, and then the third one at the end of his life, uh, pragmatism is anti-authoritarianism. Uh, is a direct pragmatist argument against semantic representationalism that doesn't go through a complaint about Kant, doesn't go through foundationalism. I think he came to be dissatisfied with uh, the argument of philosophy in the mirror of nature, not because the core argument in chapter four wasn't right, it was, uh, he was rehearsing, rationally reconstructing the stake that Sellers and Quine drove through the heart of epistemological foundationalism. Uh, and that was a good argument. But uh, as an argument against semantic representationalism, it uh, leaves something to be desired. I mean, I think one of the questions that about the relation between epistemological foundationalism and semantic inferentialism that uh, remains here uh, is about what sort of explanatory priority there might be between them. Uh, do we have to just tell one story that is semantics and epistemology at the same time. So for instance, um, I mean, that's the, the thing that, that the kind of holism at the higher level, the second parallel of the Quine Sellers holism that Fodor thought was the great bad of contemporary uh, 
philosophy, uh, this is uh, the sort of argument uh, I had years ago with Alvin Goldman uh, that you can see some um, echoes of uh, in the literature when uh, he was championing reliabilism in epistemology. So reliabilism in epistemology saying, uh, well, we know that besides being true belief, there has to be a third condition on knowledge. Uh, uh, traditionally, that's been the justification condition. We're now putting aside get here worries about the need for a fourth condition. We're talking about a third necessary condition. The reliabilist says what's, what's really needed is some way of distinguishing accidentally true beliefs from ones that, are can, ones that really are knowledge. Uh, and justification is one way of doing that, but really uh, having the belief be the output or product of a rely generally reliable belief forming process is sufficient. So we can do without the notion of justification in epistemology. Epistemology is not the study of evidence, uh, for instance. It's not the study of rationally updating your beliefs, as Bayesians uh, would have it. It's just the study of reliable belief forming mechanisms, of which uh, having reasons for your beliefs is one, but not necessarily a privileged one among them. And though I have issues about uh, how the reliabilism works, this is the barn facade examples from chapter two or three of articulating reasons. When Goldman and I were arguing about this, I said, look, the big issue as far as I'm concerned is the semantic issue. Uh, the content of the beliefs is articulated for me by the justificatory relations they stand in, by the reason relations of implication and incompatibility that they stand in to others, not by these uh, dispositional issues of uh, the forming of believings that relates the acts of believing, but the believables have to stand in these reason relations to one another to be to have the conceptual contents they do. So uh, even if what the epistemologist cares about is reliable belief forming mechanisms, you're still going to need justification to worry about justification in order to get content into your picture, the, the content of these believables. And uh, Goldman said, I've spent my entire career as an epistemologist dividing the labor uh, here and assuming that I didn't need to think about the nature of content, I could take conceptual contents propositions for granted and just worry about uh, when they were knowledge. And now you're telling me I can't do that. Well, right, that, that is the claim. Uh, now, we could think about orders of explanation. Roughly the order of explanation of making it explicit says start with the reason relations of implication and incompatibility and understand representation, representational semantic relations in terms of those. Uh, the, the tradition from Descartes to Kant goes in the other direction, starts with representations and understands reason relations in terms of them. Well, honorable exception for my rationalist and idealist um, uh, friends. The pragmatism that we'll see Rorty espousing says, you got to do these all together. You can't divide the labor between semantics and epistemology, between your theory of content uh, and, your, and your theory of knowledge or understanding. Uh, they both have uh, uh, they both essentially depend on reason relations of implication and incompatibility, reasons for and reasons against, and they both have representational uh, dimensions. Um, yeah. Okay, let me pause there for 
comments or questions? Can I ask something about um, this relation to um, the, the relation between uh, Rorty and Quine? Um, Rorty is concentrating upon um, Quine's criticism of analy analyticity, um, but um, Quine is also, uh, and Quine is arguing against reductionism into dogmas, and he's also um, um, uh, a holist, yeah. But um, he's also an empiricist, I guess, and, and a physicalist. And um, can he be an empiricist without being a representationalist? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, as I reread chapter four uh, of to tell this story, uh, I realized just how unsatisfactory I found Rorty's discussion of Klein there, because he spends really very little time rehearsing the argument he cares about from two dogmas. And the vast bulk of the discussion of Quine, which is really the second half of chapter four, is trying to say, is trying to separate the good Quine from the bad Quine, from the physicalist, naturalist, reductionist Quine, and from the Quine of posits, who still is, uh, you know, doing something like the Aufbau, uh, in, in trying to semantically uh, ground that, Anyway, trying to ground our knowledge, analyze our knowledge into constructions out of bits of sensory experience. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Rorty shouldn't have bothered with that. It didn't earn its way sort of in the book. Uh, having been a graduate student in Princeton in the years he was writing it, I understand why we spent all of our time worrying about how different bits of Klein fit together. And if he was going to say anything about it, you know, his colleagues sort of would oblige this, but it actually was irrelevant. Klein is incoherent, deeply incoherent on these points, I think. He never got his empiricist side and his naturalist side uh, together, the two sides of the, the two wings of the Vienna circle that Carnap tried to keep from flying off in separate directions. Uh, Quine never got those together. Uh, he never uh, got together his holism at the level of meaning uh, with his rejection of that entire level uh, for serious semantic work, which he says has to be done in terms of reference, that is, in terms of representation. He took uh, the holism that he comes to at the end of Two Dogmas, which is what Rorty likes and, and says, oh, this is the good pragmatist stuff. Quine took that to be a sufficient reason to banish the notion of meaning from uh, serious semantics, not to worry about relations of justification, of reason relations, about concepts, uh, to abandon all of that in favor of a pure extensional representationalist story. Uh, and that's what he pushed. And that ideology, reference not meaning, Phrygian Bedeutung not Zinn, uh, that was the ideology that his student Davidson officially took over from him. Everything has to be done in extensional first order uh, representational terms. But Davidson, by the second half of his career, has re rediscovered and rearticulated the importance of the reason relations. Uh, you know, he overcomes this uh, Quinean uh, uh, ideology. Uh, from both of their points of view, I think Quine is just a mess. Uh, he, he, he's got a whole lot of interesting ideas that he was never able to uh, uh, pull together coherently. And Rorty tries sort of heroically here to explain away uh, why, why we don't need to hold Quine's indeterminacy of translation argument against 
the quine of two dogmas of empiricism, for instance, the quine of uh, word and object and of ontological relativity. For, for our purposes here, I'd say, mm, don't worry about anything else Quine says outside of two dogmas. That's, if, if I were Rohe's editor, given chapter four, I would have said, just said, I'm only gonna talk about two dogmas of empiricism. I'll talk about the author of that rather than Quine. Um, Okay. Now, the pragmatism that uh, Roy he sees, he's on the cusp at the end of uh, uh, philosophy in the mirror of nature, sort of at the end of at the end of this argument uh, from chapter four. Uh, he's on the cusp of his mature pragmatism. I mean, you'll see he doesn't call the view that he finds in common to Quine and uh, Sellers uh, pragmatism. Uh, if we look in the chapter four uh, quotes, uh, yeah, over on page four of that, uh, he says, explaining rationality and epistemic authority by reference to what society lets us say, rather than the latter by the former, is the essence of what I shall call epistemological behaviorism, an attitude common to Dewey and Wittgenstein. And what he's arguing is common to Quine and Sellers. He says, epistemological behaviorism, which might be called simply pragmatism, were this term not a bit overladen. Well, 20 minutes after he published the book, he decided, no, that's what it should be called. It should be called pragmatism, not this more Solarzian epistemological uh, behaviorism. And in the things we'll read for next week, we'll see him sort of coming out full blown. No, this is pragmatism. And this is the lesson that we should learn uh, from all of this. Uh, the way I want to put this is it's pragmatism about norms that says that Normative statuses are always and everywhere matters of role in social practice. Uh, normative statuses of responsibility and authority, of commitment and entitlement, even where the entitlement and the authority are epistemic entitlement and authority, they're still ultimately matters of the role something plays in the practices of giving and asking for reasons of the community whose expressions these are. That's going to be his core pragmatist thought. And he's, his opponent at that point is going to be anyone who thinks that you can derive normative statuses, for instance, epistemic authority from representational relations. Uh, from there being an isomorphism between thoughts and things, for instance, as what by itself constitutes the authority of the thought, uh, its capacity to entitle you to other thoughts to justify other thoughts. That, he wants to say, cannot consist in its re representational relations if those representational relations are themselves thought of in non-normative terms. So at this point, we get a divide. If they are thought of in normative terms, then he's going to be a, a normative pragmatist about it and say, well, then we have to understand representation in uh, social practical terms. And if not, uh, then that's not cognitive authority. It's not the kind of entitlement that reason giving preserves and transmits. <clears throat> 
Uh, now, I mentioned last time in passing, and uh, maybe it's worth uh, reminding you of here, that at least, can I get enough hermeneutic distance from the claim here? I claim that Hegel reads Kant as having given a normative account of representation. That is an account in terms of authority and responsibility, which Kant talks about in terms of necessity, the rulishness of things, and Hegel talks about in terms of independence and dependence. So in Hegel, independence is authority and dependence is responsibility. Uh, and those are his terms for what Kant talks about in terms of necessity uh, in, uh, uh, in the first critique. Uh, the way this came up last time, let me remind you, is uh, so Kant is the one who introduces the terminology of representation for this Cartesian idea that everybody had been working with. Uh, it's what he makes of Leibniz's use of corresponding uh, things. And he's the one who, above all, saw Enlightenment philosophy in representational terms. But he also, besides being a philosopher of representation and having cleaned up this problem of running the different kinds of representation together in uh, Enlightenment epistemology, besides being the philosopher of representations, he's also the philosopher of rules. And uh, I think if you try and understand Kant from the top down, rather than sort of from the text bottom up, the big question is how his insights about representation and his insights about rules fit together. How, what work are those doing? How, how does he get those together? But on this story, he has a normative, that is rulish account of representation. What is it for something to purport to be a representing, to purport to stand in a representational relation to some represented thing? Well, that's for it to be subject to assessment as its correctness according to a standard that's set by what counts as playing the role of being represented by it, just in virtue of having that kind of authority over it. That is the authority that consists in the represented, setting the standard of correctness for assessments of the representing, just insofar as it's a representing of that represented. So to be a representing is to be responsible for your correctness to the represented, which is exercising authority over you, just insofar as you are a representing of it, that is acknowledge your responsibility to it, where that authority and responsibility are cashed out in terms of serving as the normative standard of correctness of a distinctive kind of assessment, normative assessment of the representing. That's the picture. Hegel's going to talk about that in terms of the independence of the represented relative to the uh, representing, the authority uh, of the one, the responsibility of the other. Insofar as that's the way you should think about representational relations, in those normative terms, Rorty's norm pragmatism about norms is going to come in and say, well, then you have to think about the role in social practices of taking or treating one thing to be a representing of another in terms of our practices of assessing representational correctness. And the question then is going to be, what's the relation between those practices and the practices of assessing the goodness of implications or exclusion? That is the reason relations that articulate concepts. Uh, that's the task uh, that I pursue in making it explicit in sort of within that um, 
uh, or pragmatist uh, compass. But uh, if you think of representational relations in non-normative terms, then Rody's going to say, well, then you can do that if that helps you uh, in doing neurophysiology and thinking about what the uh, frog's eye tells the frog's brain, then more power to you. Go wild representationally in your account of causal mechanisms, but don't think that that has any cognitive significance, any significance for knowledge, for the application of concepts, for the contents of belief. That's at most a necessary condition because cognition is a matter of cognitive authority, of committing yourself a normative status, being entitled to that commitment, of authorizing other people to uh, be committed, to inherit your entitlement. All of that is a matter of normative statuses at the personal level. Always and everywhere normative statuses are social statuses, matters of uh, a functional role something's playing in a set of social discursive practices. That's the uh, pragmatist uh, credo. What is right out uh, and what the arguments of uh, Sellers and Klein in what I'm calling the core argument of chapter four and so of uh, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature show is don't run those two stories together. Don't think that you can tell a causal representationalist story ab about sufficient conditions for having sufficient conditions now, not necessarily, sufficient conditions for having epistemic authority, for being uh, a privileged representation in the sense of privilege that uh, epistemology cares about, having an entitlement and authority that's heritable via reason relations by other uh, representations. That's running together the order, the causal order of mechanisms of uh, knowledge with the justificatory order. It's not making the Kantian distinction. Uh, it's uh, making the confusion that is the Lockean confusion that he diagnoses in uh, the first half of chapter three. Okay, well, that's the pragmatism we're going to see next time. Uh, there's sort of even more too much reading for next time, I appreciate. Uh, let me say, I did a better job for next week in getting them in the right order. So if you can only read one, read the first one, two, read the first two. Try and read the first three anyway. After that, more background stuff. This time I screwed up. Uh, chapter three should have been after chapter four. Really, the introduction in chapter four were the things, were the readings that mattered this time. Let me mention, if you didn't get to uh, the Kuklik article in the, uh, in the um, supplementary reading, uh, really only the first half of it matters much, but it is uh, a very savvy, I don't know, attack on analytic philosophy from a sociological point of view, sort of as a form of life uh, downstream from that, uh, from the point of view of an intellectual historian and social scientist. If you're ever in any degree alienated from the social practices of professionalized philosophy, I know you aren't, but if you ever uh, feel that way at all, the first half of that Kuklik essay will give you a lot of uh, ammunition and sort of words to uh, articulate your frustration with. Uh, so let me recommend it in those regards. As for the other, uh, this is Rorty in full stride. Uh, the essays you're reading now, he's being much less careful, much more hand wavy than he is being in this book. Uh, this is the writing that makes people fall in love with Rorty on the one hand, 
or absolutely turn their back on him and say, nobody should be writing this kind of crap uh, on the other hand. So you will know whether you have uh, rorty file or rorty phobe tendencies and in what uh, proportion by how you respond to these sort of first three uh, uh, or four writings uh, for next time. At least they sh you will not go to sleep reading them. I promise you that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody, and uh, I'll see you next week.